Hi, I'm Rebecca, and today we are going to be reading The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Emuska Ortsi. Uh, it is about the French Revolution and a spy who goes and rescues a bunch of people in order to save them uh, from being killed. Chapter 1. Paris, September 1792. A surging, seething, murmuring crowd of beings that are human only in name, for to the eye and the ear they seem not but savage creatures, animated by vile passions and by the lust of vengeance and of hate. The hour, some little time before sunset, and the place, the West Barricade, at the very spot where, a decade later, a proud tyrant raised an undying monument to the nation's glory and his own vanity. During the greater part of the day, the guillotine had been kept busy at its ghastly work. All that France had boasted of in the past centuries of ancient names and blue blood had paid toll to her desire for liberty and for fraternity. The carnage had only ceased at this late hour of the day because there were other more interesting sights for the people to witness, a little while before the final closing of the barricade for the night. And so the crowd rushed away from the place, place de Grève and made for the various barricades in order to watch this interesting and amusing sight. It was to be seen every day, for those aristos were such fools. They were traitors to the people, of course, all of them, men, women, and children, who happened to be descendants of the great men who, since the Crusades, had made the glory of France her old noblesse. Their ancestors had oppressed the people, had crushed them, had crushed them under the scarlet heels of their dainty buckled shoes, and now the people had become the rulers of France and crushed their former masters, not beneath their heels, for they went shoeless mostly in these days, but beneath a more effectual weight, the knife of the guillotine. And daily, hourly, the hideous instrument of torture claimed its many victims, old men, young women, tiny children, even until the day that, when it would finally demand the head of a king and a beautiful young queen. But this was as it should be. Were not the people now the rulers of France? Every aristocrat was a traitor as his ancestors had been before him. For 200 years now, the people had sweated and toiled and starved to keep a lustful court in lavish extravagance. Now the descendants of those who had helped to make those courts brilliant had to hide for their lives, to hide if they wished to avoid the tardy vengeance of the people. And they did try to hide and try to fly. That was just the fun of the whole thing. Every afternoon before the gates closed and the market carts went out in procession by the various barricades, some fool of an aristo endeavored to evade the clutches of the Committee of Public Safety. In various disguises, under various pretexts, they tried to slip through the barriers which were so well guarded by citizen soldiers of the Republic. Men in women's clothing, women in male attire, children disguised in beggars' rags. There were some of all sorts, see deviant, counts, Marquis, even dukes who wanted to fly from France, reach England or some other equally accursed country, and there try to rouse foreign feelings against the glorious revolution, or to raise an army in order to liberate the wretched prisoners in the temple who had once called themselves sovereigns of France. But they were nearly always caught at the barricades. Sergeant Bibot, especially of the West Gate, had wonderful nose for scenting an aristo in the most perfect disguise. Then, of course, the fun began. Bibo would look at his prey as a cat looks upon a mouse, play with him, sometimes for quite a quarter of an hour, pretend to be hoodwinked by the disguise, by the wigs, and other bits of theatrical makeup which hid the identity of a ci devant noble marquis or count. Oh, Bibo had a keen sense of humor, and it was well worth hanging around the West Barricade in order to see him catch an aristo in the very act of trying to flee from the vengeance of the people. Sometimes the Bebo would let his prey actually out of the gates, allowing him to think for the space of two minutes at least that he really had escaped out of Paris and might even manage to reach the coast of England in safety. But Bebo would let the unfortunate wretch walk about 10 meters towards the open country. Then he would send two men after him and bring him back, stripped of his disguise. Oh, that was extremely funny, for as often as not, the fugitive would prove to be a woman, some proud marchioness, 
who looked terribly comical when she found herself in Bebo's clutches, after all, and knew that a summary trial would await her the next day, and after that, the fond embrace of Madame la Guillotine. No wonder that on that final afternoon in September, the crowd around Bebo's gate was eager and excited. The lust of blood grows with its satisfaction. There is no satiety. The crowd had seen a hundred noble heads fall beneath the guillotine today. It wanted to make sure that it would see another hundred fall on the morrow. Bebo was sitting on an overturned and empty cask close by that gate of the barricade. A small detachment of Sidoyen soldiers were under his command. The work had been very hot lately. Those cursed aristos were becoming terrified and tried their hardest to slip out of Paris. Men, women, and children whose ancestors, even in remote ages, had served those traitorous bourbons were all traitors themselves and right food for the guillotine. Every day, Bibo had had the satisfaction of unmasking some fugitive royalists and sending them back to be tried by the Committee of Public Safety, presided over by that good patriot, Sition Fouquier-Tonville. Robespierre and Danton both had commended Bibo for his zeal, and Bibo was proud of the fact that he, on his own initiative, had sent at least 50 aristos to the guillotine. But today, all the sergeants in command at the various barricades had had special orders. Recently, a very great number of aristos had succeeded in escaping out of France and in reaching England safely. There were curious rumors about these escapes. They had become very frequent and singularly daring. The people's mind were becoming strangely excited about it all. Sergeant Grospierre had been sent to the guillotine for allowing a whole family of aristos to slip out of the north gate under his very nose. It was asserted that these escapes were organized by a band of Englishmen, whose daring seemed to be unparalleled, and who, from sheer desire to meddle in what did not concern them, spent their spare time in snatching away lawful victims destined for Madame la guillotine. These rumors soon grew in extravagance. There was no doubt that this band of meddlesome Englishmen did exist. Moreover, they seemed to be under the leadership of a man whose pluck and audacity were almost fabulous. Strange stories were afloat of how he and those aristos whom he rescued became suddenly invisible as they reached the barricades and escaped out of the gates by sheer supernatural agency. No one had seen these mysterious Englishmen, as for their leader, he was never spoken of, save with a superstitious shudder. Citoyen Spoki Tenville would, in the course of the day, receive a scrap of paper from some mysterious source. Sometimes he would find it in the pocket of his coat. At others, it would be handed to him by someone in the crowd whilst he was on his way to the sitting of the Committee of Public Safety. The paper always contained a brief notice that a band of meddlesome Englishmen were at work, and it was always signed with a device drawn in red, a little star-shaped flower which we in England call the Scarlet Pimpernel. Within a few hours of the receipt of this impudent notice, the citizens of the Committee of Public Safety would hear that so many royalists and aristocrats had succeeded in reaching the coast and were on their way to England and safety. The guards at the gate had been doubled, the sergeants in command had been threatened with death, whilst liberal rewards were offered for the capture of these daring and impudent Englishmen. There was a sum of 5,000 francs promised to the man who laid hands on the mysterious and elusive Scarlet Pimpernel. Everyone felt that Bebo would be the man, and Bebo allowed that belief to take firm root in everybody's mind. And so, day after day, people came to watch him at the West Gate so as to be present when he laid hands on any fugitive aristo who perhaps might be accompanied by that mysterious Englishman. Bah, he said to his trusted corporal, Sidian Grospierre was a fool. Had it been me now at the North Gate last week? Sidian Bebo spat on the ground to express his contempt for his comrade's stupidity. How did it happen, Sidian asked the corporal. Gospierre was at the gate keeping good watch, began Bibo pompously as the crowd closed in around him, listening eagerly to his narrative. We've all heard of this meddlesome Englishman, this accursed Scarlet Pimpernel. He won't get through my gate, Morbleu, unless he be the devil himself. But Gospierre was a fool. The market carts were going through the gates. There was one laden with casks and driven by an old man with a boy behind, beside him. Grospierre was a bit drunk, but he thought himself very clever. He looked into the casks, most of them at least, and saw they were empty and let the cart go through. A murmur of wrath and contempt went around the group of ill-cad wretches who crowded around Sidian Bebo. Half an hour later, continued the sergeant, up comes the captain of the guard with a squad of some dozen soldiers with him. Has the cart gone through? he asked of Grospierre breathlessly. 
Yes, says Grospierre, not half an hour ago. And you have let them escape, shouts the captain furiously. You go to the guillotine for this, Citian sergeant. That cart held concealed the ci vivant Duc de Chalice and his family. What? thundered Grospierre aghast. Aye, and the driver was none other than that cursed Englishman, the Scarlet Pimpernel. A howl of execration greeted this tale. Citian Grospierre had paid for his blunder on the guillotine, but what a fool, oh, what a fool. Bibot was laughing so much at his own tale that it was some time before he could continue. After them, my men, shouts the captain, he said after a while. Remember the reward. After them, they cannot have gone far. And with that, he rushed through the gates, followed by his dozen soldiers. But it was too late, shouted the crowd excitedly. They never got them. Curse that gross fear for his folly. He deserved his fate. Fancy not examining those casks properly. But these sallies seemed to amuse City and Bebo exceedingly. He laughed until his sides ache and tears streamed down his cheeks. Nay, nay, he said at last. Those aristos weren't in the cart. The driver was not the Scarlet Pimpernel. What? No, the captain of the guard was that damned Englishman in disguise, and every one of his soldiers is aristos. The crowd this time said nothing. The story certainly savored of, of the supernatural, and though the Republic had abolished God, it had not quite succeeded in killing the fear of the supernatural in the hearts of people. Truly, the Englishman must be the devil himself. The sun was sinking low down in the west. Bebo prepared himself to close the gates. And about the carts, he said. Some dozen covered carts were drawn up in a row, ready to leave town, in order to fetch the produce from the country close by for market the next morning. They were mostly well known to Bebo as they went through his gate twice every day on their way to and from the town. He spoke to one or two of the drivers, mostly women, and was at great pains to examine the inside of the carts. You never know, he would say, and I'm not going to be caught like that fool gross pair. The women who drove the carts usually spent their day on the Place de Greve beneath the platforms of the guillotine, knitting and gossiping, while they watched the rows of tumbrils arriving with the victims the reign of terror claimed every day. It was a great fun to see the aristos arriving for the reception of Madame la Guillotine, and the places close by the platform were very much sought after. Bebo during the day had been on duty on the place. He recognized most of the old hats, tricotesses, as they were called, who sat there and knitted, whilst head after head fell beneath the knife, and they themselves got quite bespatted with the blood of those cursed aristos. He, the mare, said Bebo to one of these horrible hags. What have you got there? He had seen her earlier in the day with her knitting and the whip of her cart close beside her. Now she had fastened a row of curly locks to the whip handle, all colors from gold to silver, fair to dark, and she stroked them with her huge bony finger as she laughed at Bebo. I made friends with Madame Guillotine's lover, she said with a coarse laugh. He cut these off me for the heads as they roll down. He has promised me some more tomorrow, but I don't know if I shall be at my usual place. Ah, how is that, Lemaire? asked Bebo, who, hardened soldier that he was, could not help shuddering at the awful loathsomeness of the semblance of a woman with her ghastly trophy on the handle of her whip. My grandson has got the smallpox, she said with a jerk of her thumb toward the inside of her cart. Some say it's the plague. If it is, I shan't be allowed to come into Paris tomorrow. At the first mention of the word smallpox, Bebo had stepped hastily backwards, and when the old hag spoke of the plague, he retreated from her as fast as he could. Curse you, he muttered, whilst the whole crowd hastily avoided that cart, leaving it standing all alone in the midst of the place. The old hag laughed. Curse you, Citian, for being a coward, she said. Bah, what a man to be afraid of sickness. Morbleu, the plague! Everyone was awestruck and silent, filled with horror for the loathsome malady, the one thing which still had the power to arouse terror and disgust in these savage, brutalized creatures. Get out with you and your plague-stricken brood, shouted Bebo hoarsely. And with another rough laugh and coarse jest, the old hag whipped up her lean nag and drove her cart out of the gate. This incident had spoiled the afternoon. The people were terrified of these two horrible curses, the two maladies which nothing could cure and which were the precursors of an awful and lonely death. They hung about the barricade, silent and sullen for a while, eyeing one another suspiciously, avoiding each other as if by instinct, lest the plague lurked already in their midst. Presently, as in the case of Grospierre, a captain of the guard appeared suddenly, but he was known to Bebo, and there was no fear of his turning out to be a sly Englishman in disguise. 
A cart, he shouted breathlessly, even before he had reached the gate. What cart? asked Bebo roughly. Driven by an old hag, a covered cart. There were a dozen. An old hag who said her son had the plague? Yes. You have let them go? More bleu, said Bebo, whose purple cheeks had suddenly become white with fear. The cart contained the ci devant Comtesse de Tournay and her two children, all of them traitors and condemned to death. And their driver, muttered Bebo as superstitious shudder ran down his spine. Sacré tonnerre, said the captain, but it is feared that it was that accursed Englishman himself, the Scarlet Pimpernel. End of chapter one of the Scarlet Pimpernel. I hope you enjoyed listening to chapter one of the Scarlet Pimpernel. If you are interested in reading the rest of it, please check out our catalog or on Libby. I will be reading another book next week. Thank you for joining me for Quick Book Looks. Have a wonderful day.